OK, so we're in the middle of uh, notes number 13. We're looking at the results of um, a uh, Caltech Seismolab uh, PhD thesis. Um, we're talking about Gene Humphreys' uh, results and his thesis. Uh, and in that, he used a data set which was from an earlier thesis, probably uh, um, from uh, 82 or 83. And I, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember who the uh, author of that thesis is. But basically, she picked arrival times of earthquakes, uh, P waves from earthquakes all over the world across the Southern California network which has, uh, I think, over 100 stations at the time, and you know, maybe in 1979. And there are hundreds of earthquakes, so there's lots of crossing paths in the upper mantle below Southern California, you know, down to maybe uh, five, 600 kilometers depth. And depending on the azimuth and the distance that the uh, earthquake waves are coming in from, you know, this earthquake that's almost at the antipode is producing a series of early arrivals right across the transverse ranges. Um, and if you uh, if you've heard of it, the big bend of the San Andreas Fault is right through here. So maybe I should actually draw the. No, that would be a, a time waster. Um, uh, an exercise for the uh, uh, over-interested here would be to uh, draw in the trace of the San Andreas Fault, which uh, comes up from the Salton Sea like this, um, heels over into the Big Bend, mm -hmm. and then takes off uh, north 40 uh, west again uh, towards uh, San Francisco. So the origin and the Nature of the Big Bend has, has long, uh, um, you know, inspired uh, a lot of uh, geological and geophysical work. Uh, it ought to be a constraining bend, right? A uh, a left step in a right lateral fault should be a constraining bend, and that is um, really what uh, the story is that uh, Gene Humphreys put together, given this very early tomography of the Southern California mantle, one of the earliest tomographies uh, of any type. And here's the evidence that the, uh, um, that the anomaly, the slowness anomalies of the mantle, these early arrivals are uh, for waves coming straight up into Southern California. The early arrivals are on the axis of the transverse range. And for arrivals that are coming in from Japan, you know, heading basically southeastward down the San Andreas Fault um, from an intermediate distance, then the early arrivals, uh, that shadow of early arrivals, shifts uh, down to the, uh, the southeast. And it's actually completely, the anomaly is completely off the axis of the transverse ranges which is right here. So that's uh, uh, a very prominent shift. If um, no matter where the earthquake was, you know, which azimuth, which, uh, um, which delta distance, uh, which angle it was coming up, if the arrivals, if, if the early arrivals uh, maintained the same location and the same magnitude, then what would you know? What would you suspect if the early arrivals had not moved at all, um, depending on uh, um, on the angle of the uh, the wave coming up through the mantle? What would you know about uh, where the where the velocity, uh, the slowness heterogeneities are? Um, well, there are plenty of places, and in fact, this data set has 
has uh, these terms taken out. There are plenty of places where there are um, what's called surface consistent um, delays, surface consistent amplitude effects. So if the only thing that's consistent about a particular delay is, um, is that it's always the same at the same station, then you know that that, that anomaly is right under the station. Right? No matter which direction you hit it from, uh, from the mantle, that anomaly is, uh, is located right under the station. You know, think back to that early uh, couple weeks ago when I showed you, uh, a few weeks ago actually, when I showed you that example of uh, velocity anomalies at the reflector, in between the reflector and the surface, and at the surface. The, the feature of the, of the anomalies at the surface was that they always stayed at the same x, no matter what the angle. So, Where are they deciding with zero here and no delay? Uh, that would be relative to, um, uh, to the delay pr predicted by this radially symmetric Earth model. OK. So okay. it's faster or slower with respect to that model. Right, right. So you. You, you have the earthquake's location. I mean, that's one variable, obviously, that, that needs to be settled by some other means, you know, hopefully independently of your data set. Um, not always, of course. Um, you have the earthquake's uh, source parameters, which include its location and its origin time. Um, you know, that's when that first P wave should be uh, coming out of it. And uh, then you use the ellipsoidally, basically radially symmetric Earth model. Um, and this one is actually adjusted for Southern California. So it's not truly radially symmetric, but it's meant to be more of a Southern California average, provides more of a Southern California average time. But that's a very good question, because in a lot of tomography studies, you know, the anomaly is always relative just to the average delay. right? Uh, we saw here that what um, Humphreys had done is, you know, he plotted for us here the delays relative to the um, the delays relative to the uh, the um, um, to the radially symmetric model, but you can see that that the av the the mode of the delays. Is a little bit positive. Still, okay. So a lot of studies will will take that peak in the distribution, and they'll set that as the zero delay, and everything else is relative. Um, now you know, given that that you're supposed to apply the uh, you know in the inverse transform, you're supposed to apply the 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 row filter, and remove the uh, uh, the constant component of the of the slowness perturbations anyway, maybe that's not a big deal. And what people, uh, if you look carefully at, uh, yeah, I guess you'll get the same interpretation. That's right. That's right. They're looking for. They're still, even though we're getting here um, velocity anomalies, you know, in terms of percentage of total velocity, they're still interpreted in a very simple structural way. Okay, and that's the first. You know that's the first cut, which you know can be extremely revealing. Um, but are these you know are these delays really representative? I mean, I'm sorry. Are these slowness perturbations truly representative of the real slowness perturbations? You know, are they are they um, are they are they really um, the right amplitude or not? I mean, is it the right amount of slowness perturbation? Well, if you look at the point spread functions, you would say no, no way. Okay. Um, but uh, uh, and if you look at you know checkerboard tests, you know you're lucky in a checkerboard test if you recover one tenth of the amount of the anomaly. You know, you, you publish it if you can recover you know, some sort of hazy checkerboard pattern in some areas. You can publish it. 
but if if uh, you know if your checkerboard test uh, only recovers ten percent of the of the actual you know synthetic checkerboard anomaly, you know you say that in your paper, but you don't you don't uh, you don't really display it prominently, and your colleagues will probably accept it. So so these tomographies are. Uh, you know, even after iteration, even after including nonlinearity, they're only um, because they're linearized. They're only recovering part of the perturbation. Another reason for the power of Satish's optimization: it's 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 entirely nonlinear, and so it doesn't have to rely on any linearization, and so the velocity that you get out is a complete velocity. It's a to, it's a total velocity. It's going to be wrong by some, you know. It's going to be uncertain by some amount. Uh, you you go and check it at one particular place, and it's going to be different. Okay, but it's a complete velocity, and you're you're predicting a complete travel time, not a travel time perturbation. Um, okay. Well, we'll see more of that later. Here's uh, these early results on a bunch of north-south cross sections, A through E. Um, the, uh, the primed letter is uh, uh, on the right, and that's to the north. So these are west-looking cross sections. Um, and I think, uh, I think our structural geology instructor professor was trying to teach us to make east-looking cross sections at the time. Um, so this wouldn't have passed his muster, but it made sense to us somehow. Um, uh, and the um, uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't have good even good grayscale printing at that time, um, and we certainly didn't have color printing. So um, the the slowness perturbations. And, and note here, I, I'm just noticing. Uh, maybe the scale is on some other is on some other um, um, is on some other um, figure. But uh, you know, this figure is interpreted structurally. It's not interpreted uh, in terms of the overall uh, amplitude of the anomaly. And there's no you know slowness perturbation scale here. So these uh, circles in here are uh, and these open circles, the open circles and closed circles, those are uh, negative slowness perturbations. In other words, that's a fast blob. And these uh, these are kind of heavy pluses if you uh, can see past my scanning. Um, uh, yeah, not very easily. Um, so those are positive slowness perturbations uh, around the edges. Okay, and white is a near zero slowness perturbation. So the positive slowness perturbation is a is a lower velocity. Okay, so at A, right, right here at the axis of the transverse ranges, right in the uh, in the middle, we have a uh, a negative slowness perturbation, a fast blob, and uh, it seems to be uh, coming out most strongly near the surface. The uh, depth scale you can see this is going down to 800 kilometers depth. Um, you know the uh, 670 discontinuity uh, is uh, going to be down here somewhere. All right, uh, you can see we're probably losing resolution at the 670 discontinuity, so. You know these images did not answer for uh, our professor Don Anderson um, uh, the question of whether um, there's uh, mantle convection flow across the 670 discontinuity. He's a big geochemical advocate of um, of no flow across the uh, 670 discontinuity, um, and the uh, anomaly as you go to the east. Uh, say here, right across B is really right across Los Angeles. Um, it is uh, uh, the anomaly is uh, 
uh, starting to, to thicken and deepen and become stronger. Um, and C is through, uh, it's a little bit west, of, through Oceanside, through the San Onofre nuclear plant. Uh, it's through Cajon Pass, um, right there, uh, the intersection of the San Jacinto Fault with the San Andreas. And um, it uh, is, uh, reaches its, its maximum thickness and depth. Um, kind of maintains for a little bit uh, at the latitude, uh, at longitude of Palm Springs. Okay, so this is uh, C is at San Bernardino, Cajon Pass, D is at Palm Springs, and E is in the Imperial Valley. <clears throat> and you can see that it's still, uh, there's still this fast thing uh, hanging down here, a little bit to the uh, it seems to be bending a little bit to the south. Okay. Um, so that's the uh, you know the major interpretation Gene made off this uh, this set of cross sections. Uh, here's some examples he showed of point spread functions. So these are rows of the information matrix, L transpose L. Okay. So uh, you know you you take the uh, uh, the the autocorrelation, if you will, that's present, you know, the length squared that's present in the information matrix, and um, you uh, and here, uh, um, you know, Gene calls it an average reconstruction of an anomalous block of unit magnitude to a single back projection. Okay, so that's uh, the block is here between uh, two seventy and three hundred kilometers depth. And you can see it spread out uh, along the prominent ray directions uh, upwards. Right here from 0 to 30 kilometers, you can see that the point spread function is uh, most prominent along the, um, uh, really a lot down the axis of the Southern California network. Uh, and uh, it's coming to the, uh, toward the surface here, so it's you know, spreading, spreading up and, and spreading out. Um, and then uh, if you go deeper than the block, right, it's spreading towards the main, uh, uh, the main earthquakes again. You know, so it's like a, uh, an hourglass. Uh, here's the neck of the hourglass, and here it is uh, going up to the surface, and here it is going down into the mantle, uh, spreading out, kind of in a combination of ray directions you know, between the sources and the and the receivers. The uh, the the utility of this was showing that the anomaly that uh, he was looking at, which uh, I haven't shown you in map view yet, uh, but basically it's east west, and that's not really, you know, the east west anomaly is not really in the same direction does not really have the same geometry as the point spread function. So that was a, a very important point in his thesis. You know, his the anomaly that he's trying to interpret is not just due to the point spread functions. Here's a checkerboard test. Now let's see. Um, so it's inversion on uh, random noise travel time residuals. Uh, no, that can't be a checkerboard test then. So this is uh, kind of a, um, uh, this is actually similar to the Harlan procedure. So he's taking um, random noise residuals, OK? Um, and uh, you know the whole thing is divided into blocks. That's why it has this checkerboardy, blocky appearance here. Um, the whole uh, upper mantle of Southern California. So here we're looking uh, 90 to 120 kilometers depth. Here's uh, 300 to 330 kilometers depth. And again, you know you can see a lineup of the inversion of random noise arrival times. You know delays basically. So so you know I'm sure. Gene took great pains to uh, to make his random arrivals, you know, have this same uh, uh, histogram. Okay, so uh, 
this is much like Harlan's idea, um, but he didn't. Uh, he didn't. You know, carrying out Harlan's idea on this sort of tomography study would involve basically taking these data delays and randomizing their location. You know, that would be kind of a. Uh, uh, there's a word for that too. Uh, uh, it's not exactly a jackknife test. It's a uh, which uses half the data at a time. Um, it's a different kind of test whose name I've forgotten now. Um, but uh, uh, you could do that uh, by scrambling the data. I mean, we scramble our our seismic sections by reversing the sign of about half the traces randomly. And <clears throat> you know, what could you do here? Well. You could take uh, you know this uh, arrival time and uh, you know resort the the order of the stations so that that arrival time gets assigned to that station out there. It'd be the same the same difference. Well, then you then you input that you know you you have the same ray set no matter what, right? Same station locations, same same uh, so, uh, earthquake locations, same ray set. And so you just back project that and iterate, um, you know, through the uh, with that, you know, synthetically random data set. And so the, here's what he's showing you here is the result of that, okay, which is a, uh, you know, kind of a random, uh, uh, you know, like you see, used to see on analog. No, actually, this looks like, uh, you know, bad reception on a digital TV. Um, The the okay again the point is that when you uh, when you put random data into the inversion, it's not a property of the ray set itself that's giving you this east west high velocity trend across the transverse ranges along the transverse ranges. So that's the that's really the point. You know you're you're showing that it's. Uh, it's really a property of the data set. It's it's this it's this moving shadow, okay. That's really what's required to reconstruct this um, uh, this structure here, this slab hanging uh, you know 500 kilometers down into the mantle. This fast slab, and notice it's hanging vertically. It's not uh, dipping at you know. Thirty or forty or seventy degrees, like uh, like a um, like a subduction uh, a, your your standard subduction slab. This is really the first example of uh, of uh, drip tectonics that was uh, that was looked at. Mantle uh, mantle drips. Uh, Don Anderson challenged Gene. He said, "Okay, everything comes from rays here." Um, and you don't have any stations down in the mantle, so you're not going to be able to reconstruct an empty box. Okay, and and Gene did it. He showed that yes, the ray set is able to reconstruct an empty box. Um, you know, like a shell. So here's the reconstruction. The top of the box was was in this. Um, um, in in this, um, you know, again, this is all using the real ray set. Um, the top of the box was at this depth level, zero to thirty kilometers. Um, no, I'm sorry, that's near the surface. Okay, the top of the box is supposed to be here, at uh, ninety to one hundred twenty kilometers. You know, at one hundred eighty to two hundred ten kilometers, we we're looking through the middle of the box, and so it's got a, a a uh, slow wall and a fast inside, okay, or averagely averagely fast inside, and then uh, 270 to 300 kilometers. Um, it's uh, we should be getting towards the bottom of the box, but we can't see the the bottom of the box very very clearly. So, um, uh, you know, Anderson uh, found this demonstration quite. Uh, um, Quite amazing, uh, and if you could convince the Seismolab director at the time, then uh, you were in pretty good shape. So here's uh, the uh, you know like uh, 
uh, science paper version of of Gene's uh, images. Um, you know, he's uh, uh, showing that he's doing a grid that was uh, a three D grid that was uh, you know rotated relative to uh, the east west uh, axes. And uh, let's see what depth range is he showing here? I suspect it's at uh, uh, a couple of hundred kilometers. And so the blue section, okay, right here, is um, showing that uh, uh, at the east end of the uh, at the east end of the um, transverse ranges, you have a uh, you have the the a deeper box, okay, and um, uh, the bo the I'm sorry, you have a deeper slab, and that the slab is actually uh, kind of wedge shaped, and tapers to become uh, rather shallow um, uh, at the west end, okay, and then here's a cross section of the slab along this basically north south um, uh, section. And you can see it's quite thin, just uh, 20 to 30 kilometers thick. So that's a kind of a stunning surprise. Um, and then this other section here, uh, what that is showing is really the uh, low velocities, the uh, large slowness perturbations near the surface at, uh, at the Salton Sea at, the, uh, at Imperial Valley. Which you would is that exactly what you would expect, because the uh, Imperial Valley is really, and the Salton Sea are really an oceanic spreading center, um, that just happens to be buried by sediment from the Colorado River. So you'd expect uh, lots of melt and low velocities in the upper mantle, but it should be restricted to the uppermost mantle where you can get decompression uh, melting. And that's what you see. It's restricted to the upper 100 kilometers, I think it is. How deep are these sections? He's not saying. OK. Um, and the, um, uh, the slab is really uh, the tectonic drip that's been forced by the development of the, uh, um, uh, by the progressive development of the uh, Big Bend. So the Big Bend began as a constraining bend um, on the eastern side, and basically spread to the west. So, you know, the material here has been uh, subducting into the mantle, if that's what you want to call it, uh, for a lot less time than the material on the east side. So it's this kind of downgoing wedge, but it's going straight down. <clears throat> Here's another view, you know, from the original thesis figures, which. Um, you know, at A, uh, on an east-west section, you don't see much anomaly. At B, you know, you're in the transverse ranges, you start to see it. Um, at C, um, you're uh, you're right in the middle of it, and there's its you know clear wedge shape. <clears throat> and uh, at D, um, you know, you're you're off the uh, <clears throat> you know very thin wedge. You're off it again. Um, you know, really just point spread functions, spreading things out um, laterally, north and south of the wedge of the slab, and then this E section is through the Imperial Valley, and there's the uh, the, the low velocities due to decompression melting. So, um, you know, Jeans was just the first, uh, you know, and. So Gene took a data set that had been, um, uh, you know, interpreted by a previous student, but <clears throat> uh, he uh, he was inspired by Clayton to, uh, you know, write his own tomography code, and uh, and he achieved it, and he discovered this uh, slab, which actually um, there was a, a Peter Bird, a structural geologist at UCLA, um, had uh, proposed it uh, earlier. And Gene found it, and he was able to identify. You could theoretically start the. Uh, um, <clears throat> you could have you could have begun the subduction of this slab near the west end of the uh, um, of the Big Bend, uh, but he proved that 
absolutely, uh, it had been um, done at the, uh, it had started at the uh, east end. And, you know, he showed how thick it is, which is really pretty thin for a lithosphere, but, you know, not in a tectonic area like Southern California, you know, so close to a, a spreading center. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the depth extent of the slab shows how long the Big Bend had been in existence, which is just, you know, five million years. It only took five million years to uh, get this uh, to, uh, I think, uh, uh, two or three hundred kilometers depth. Um, so it was really, uh, um, really quite a discovery and set off a, a flurry of similar, um, of similar investigations. Uh, everybody with a seismic network was uh, trying to locate uh, earthquakes. Uh, you know, across the world, and uh, uh, probably uh, showed it's the whole reason for the Incorporated Research Institutes for Seismology, IRIS. Um, you know, when NSF saw that this sort of thing was possible, then they decided to fund their own uh, global seismic network. Before that, seismic networks were funded mo mainly for nuclear detection purposes, you know, say by the Air Force, and the data were not freely available. So it was with the rise of uh, IRIS and, and the open data policies that they advocated, that's when these, um, uh, that's when these, uh, these sorts of results began to proliferate. And we began to be able to delineate uh, what's going on in the, in the upper mantle and still going on um, today you know, with uh, all the work centered around the EarthScope Observatory. Okay, so uh, time for a little uh, a little review. All right, I'm into notes number fourteen now. We've taken a look at um, um, at classical travel time tomography, and uh, we've looked at the first example of mantle tomography, which it was my uh, great privilege to be able to witness the birth of. Um, and, uh, you know, naturally this, this propelled Gene Humphreys' uh, academic career to uh, great heights. Um, he's one of these people who's so well respected that, that he can put out some kind of wild idea and he'll set whole, you know, NSF divisions, uh, uh, you know, cranking away on it. You know, they'll direct whatever whatever money uh, they can find to uh, you know the little bits we have. Um, they'll direct it towards uh, work on his uh, on his wild idea. <clears throat> uh, he's at uh, University of Oregon, um, so he was uh, Glenn Biazzi's advisor um, and uh, many other prominent scientists' uh, uh, advisor. All right. So we're going to, for tomography in, uh, in, as a general idea, we're going to assume we have some kind of linear system. Um, you know, so the data is equal to some L matrix applied to a model. Okay? And these are data and model are column vectors. The tomographic approximation is that the off-diagonal elements of L transpose L are 0. Okay? Which means that you can get a first estimate m sub zero of the model, okay, by simply doing a back projection, uh, which is d inverse. That's the d is the diagonal of L transpose L, okay. Obviously, partition to get rid of the the blocks that have no rays for the the tomographic problem, the travel time tomography problem, okay. D inverse applied to L transpose, which is applied to d, right. So the, uh, the data gets hit just with, not with L inverse, but L transpose, and then scaled by D inverse. OK? Very, very simple. All right? Uh, we can use uh, iteration uh, via a least squares update. OK? So uh, you take the, uh, the data, um, and you... Um, you, you, you take the current model, you know, let's say that's m sub k there, and 
you operate on it with L, so you're generating synthetic times from that model if you're doing a travel time tomography. So you have synthetic data, you subtract it from the real data, and then you back project that. Okay? Then you uh, apply L transpose again and, uh, and D inverse. Okay? So it's a back projection of forward projected errors. So you can just keep cycling through that, right? Uh, you know, this m, m sub k, could be the result of many previous operations. So really, there's kind of a, a, a nested series, a recursive series, um, and it's a it's it's an iteration. Uh, you know, we we we're going to address later naughty issues like does it ever converge? Can we, you know, how fast can we make it converge? Um, you know, that, that sort of issue we're going to address later. I'm not addressing it here. Uh, so you don't even know if this is going to work. Okay? So far as I've demonstrated to you, uh, you know, it works as well as it appears to work, right? You know, Gene Humphreys, he had, he had that uh, random noise test. He had the... Uh, um, uh, he had the point spread functions, you know, all of that were his arguments as to why this is true. Okay. Um, okay. So we've looked at travel time tomography, where the data are delays, delta t's, and uh, and then our our matrix, our operator, our linear operator is uh, ray lengths in uh, uh, in blocks. And uh, those are multi that operates on uh, a model of slowness perturbations delta s. We take um, uh, you know L we know is is related to the radon transform and the slant stack. So uh, you know there are certain conditions where it can be done that easily. Okay, and we know that the uh, um, we know that when it is a radon transform, that an inverse exists. Okay, we can write the inverse. Uh, is the inverse any good? That's another question. But um, at least, uh, at least we know what the iteration should be homing in on, because we know the inverse exists for travel time tomography as a slant stack. Okay. So um, we take the first uh, uh, we take the first model as a as a constant. Um, I'm sorry. This is the reference model. We take the reference model as uh, as constant, um, and we have a slant stack. Uh, we have um, a variable reference model, okay, and it's it's kind of a pseudo slant stack. Um, we can't represent it. You know, we can't operate on it with a slant stack program. We got to write a um, a matrix iteration, okay. So uh, you know, we use the least squares idea. With um, the next delta s model estimate being um, uh, L transpose L, a damped L transpose L inverse, okay, adding uh, uh, some lambda along the identity and um, uh, along the uh, the uh, some lambda along the diagonal, uh, uh, which is an identity ma matrix, and um, um, using this. To scale the back projection, okay, which again is just L transpose delta t. The impulse response to um, to one block at number b is uh, just a row of the um, uh, just a row of the uh, uh, let's say this is a row of the of L transpose L, and the impulse response is the same. The columns of L transpose L as well. Are impulse responses point spread functions? Okay, so we saw the uh, the Humphreys example. What I'm going to go into now is uh, what I um, like to call reflection tomography, and it's going to turn out to be migration. There are uh, four assumptions, which boil down most importantly to what I'm going to call the Born approximation. Okay. Which says that the uh, reflectivity potential v is equal to a background reflectivity potential plus a uh, a delta v, 
a, um, uh, a reflectivity potential anomaly. And delta v, again, you know, the Born approximation uses a linearization. Delta v is much, much less than v0. Now, the reason for this Born approximation is, uh, is, is pure practicality. Okay? It just gives us a simple linear way of, of predicting the, the primary reflections. Okay? And that's the whole, the whole reason for having a small delta v relative to v0 is that we don't want to deal with multiple reflections. If we want to deal with multiple reflections, you know, the Born approximation, we can still we can actually still use it, <clears throat> but uh, it gets more complicated. So we're going to have uh, P wave data, say, uh, that is uh, you know this is our, our pressure field, and and here in this this is in the uh, Fourier domain now. <clears throat> And we're going to write it as a bunch of uh, Green's functions. It's a bunch of, uh, as, as you see, there's a bunch of convolutions. Okay, so um, the direct P wave is uh, a, um, a Green's function for a direct wave G naught, and uh, that is multiplied at every frequency by by our uh, the Fourier transform of our source wavelet, uh, which might be a vibrator. Uh, um, you know, a, a correlated vibrator wavelet. Okay, so that's s of omega, and then we have what's this? Okay, this is uh, the uh, the vibrator uh, uh, wavelet s of omega um, operated on and and in the Fourier domain here multiplied by g naught. Okay, it's a direct wave from the vibrator. Down to the reflecting point, where we see a uh, a uh, uh, reflection potential v. Okay, so we we operate on the source wave by the uh, by the Green's function for direct propagation from the source down to the reflector. We operate on it by you know v is basically the uh, reflection coefficient. Okay, and then um, and then we uh, then we bring that reflected wave back to the surface to the receiver with a number, another g naught as another direct wave. Okay, so that's a primary reflection. All right, here's a multiple reflection. Okay, and this is the part we're not going to keep. Um, we have the uh, we have the um, the the source wavelet, um, and then that gets propagated down to. Uh, a reflector, where it gets operated on by the the reflectivity potential v, and then there's uh, uh, direct propagation to another reflector, where there's a different v, okay, and then propagation to the surface. So that's a that's a uh, you know a, a a double reflection, okay. And and of course this is a series; it goes on. You know you can have uh, uh, you know, a million of these v's in there, and you know, of course, in real wave propagation, especially shallow, you see that um, you see lots and lots of uh, multiples, and in fact, multiples are, are they start to interfere with each other in, in under certain circumstances, and they become surface waves, and of course, uh, our sources generate lots of surface wave energy, and so by you know taking only the first two terms. Of our born approximated data, we're um, uh, we're cutting out ninety percent of the amplitude in our ninety percent of the energy in our sections. What is, how does the first term come? The first term is the direct P wave. Direct, direct. Yeah, yeah. You know that's from the source to the receiver, geo. Okay. Yeah. So again, if we're just looking at a uh, a reflection section and we've Clipped out the direct wave, um, then you only have one term. Very simple linear relationship. Okay, so that's the linearization we're going to talk about. Okay. Um, all right. For um, uh, for uh, a background uh, constant uh, velocity model. 
you know, where, uh, uh, and remember, uh, uh, acoustic velocity is made up out of the incompressibility K and the uh, density rho, right? So you, have, you can separate your rho and K models, and you might like to do that, right? Because you'd like to know if a reflector comes about because of a density perturbation, which is likely to be, say, uh, a gas pocket, versus a, a, an incompressibility per perturbation, which would be, um, you know, say, uh, just a change from sand to shale, or a, uh, um, a change in fracture, okay, will affect the incompressibility. But if you have oil or gas, you could think, ah, well, that should have, that should have more change on, uh, more effect on, uh, you know, a disproportionate effect on rho. So you'd like to be able to separate, instead of just velocity, you'd like to be able to separate, you know, changes in density, some d rows from some dk's. And in the Fourier domain for constant velocity, we're going to show that, uh, uh, early, well, I mean, a constant background model. All right. We're going to show that um, the um, or reference model and straight rays that uh, the you can use a migration, okay, of multi-offset data to separate rho and k. So we're going to get our first look at you know towards the amplitude versus offset idea, and and how do we separate uh, you know our uh, our uh, uh, our medium parameters. Okay, uh, if we have um, if we have uh, variable um, reference models and bent rays, then uh, um, we uh, uh, we deal with reflectors as effective point sources, which we've been doing all along, ever since we started using the exploding reflector model. Okay, that's effective. That's uh, basically uh, you know, point sources along the reflector. Um, we're going to deal with it with um, uh, Born modeling and what I would call Kirchhoff inversion, which uh, really is very, very closely related to Kirchhoff migration. And I'll show you exactly how mathematically. Okay, so we have a C that's in the model space. Uh, that's our um, our rho and k model. Or, or delta delta rho delta k model. Um, this is the Born uh, operator, okay, which uh, includes uh, this uh, this term here, g v g g naught v g naught applied to s, <clears throat> um, and then uh, we invert it, not by inverting b, which is you know that would be uh, uh, to do that, well, you know, to do it in full wave, that's uh, that's reverse time migration, um, but by doing a uh, by transposing b, and I'll show you what the transpose of b looks like, okay, and you'll see that it's it's basically a migration. So you apply b transpose to your reflection data, and you get an estimate of the of the Earth model c that separates rho. Delta rho from delta k, and I'll talk a bit about uh, elastic inversion. Okay, um, where uh, uh, as we have on on land for sure, um, you know each reflector is some combination of of delta rho, delta lambda, and delta mu. The Lemay elastic lambda parameter, uh, the mu is the rigidity, rho is still the density. Okay. So uh, that's where we've been here with tomography and where we're going.